Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. I'm E.G. Marshall, the man who delivers your daily supply of chills and goosebumps. On Mystery Theater, where almost nothing is impossible and the improbable is commonplace, we often deal with things to come. And while we don't set ourselves up as an authentic oracle, we do sometimes give you something to think about and to shudder over. Listen and see if you don't agree. It's easy enough when things are going well, Carl. But when they start to turn sour, that's when you have to begin earning your goodies. But this thing, Paul, this thing you're talking about, it's too much. I can't get mixed up in it. I mean, I can. You'll be okay. You just have to get used to the idea, that's all. It's a business deal. Just a business deal. Don't think of it as murder. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Identity Crisis, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Field and Farrington and stars Gordon Gould. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The standard engine is a V8. Standard tires, steel belted radios. There are front and rear stabilizer bars, special springs and shock valving, fast ratio power steering, and a rally steering wheel. What makes all this interesting is that it belongs to a full-size six-passenger Buick, the 1977 LeSabre Sport Coupe. You'll have to drive it to believe it. Here in my hand is a little capsule. It's contact. It contains enough cold medicine to help relieve cold symptoms caused by every known virus. Think about that the next time you're sick. Sneezing, dripping, all clogged up. Then let us help you with real medicine, like contact. We're number one in the whole world. Give your cold to contact. Real medicine for real cold. Take only as direct. What do you suppose your great-grandfather would have said if you had told him that one day men would fly to the moon, land there, and plant an American flag, too? That a man's heart could be taken from his body and put in another man's body to replace his ailing one. That by clicking a button here on Earth, you could take a picture of a rock pile on Mars. <laughs> He'd tell you to go and have your head examined. Well... What would you say if we suggested that someday in the future, not only heart transplants, but brain transplants would be possible? Ridiculous? Maybe. Or are you perhaps just being a grandfather when you say so? Come in, Mrs. Hollis. Thank you, Doctor. And this is Mrs. Kemperer? That's right. I suppose you're wondering why I've asked you to stop in at my office, both of you at the same time. I yes. just wondered about it. Well, you two have one thing in common. I suppose you know that. Our, our husbands. Yes. Both your husbands are in critical condition. In terminal condition, unfortunately. You've both been told that separately. Yes, yes. What I want to suggest now is that it may be, may be, I say, possible to save one of them. It's just possible that the one whole man may continue to live. But if they're both... Which man? Hear me out, please. Mrs. Hollis, your husband is suffering from massive internal injuries sustained in an automobile crash yesterday. Yes? He's being kept alive from minute to minute. But I'm afraid he can't possibly last much longer. 
I was told that yesterday. Yes. And your husband, Mrs. Kemper, has had a malignant brain tumor removed. The operation could be called successful in that the tumor was removed and your husband is still alive. But brain damage has already been done. And, of course, that cannot be repaired. I understand that, yes. He will not improve. And he cannot be expected to live in this condition for more than, say, a few weeks. Yes. So you've already told me. Now, Mrs. Hollis, your husband's brain was undamaged in the accident. What are you suggesting? A brain transplant. A brain transplant? I've never heard of such a thing. The fact is, it's never been done before. Not with the human brain. Well, then... But I've been experimenting with animals for many years. My last three experiments have been completely successful. Completely successful. And you think it can be done with our husband? You must understand that I cannot promise success. It still must be called experimental. Techniques will be needed which are not yet... However, I believe that it can be done. Oh, it's, it's quite overwhelming. Well, the thing is, to put it bluntly, we have absolutely nothing to lose. Your husbands are both going to die. There's no question whatever about that. Maybe this way, if the surgery is successful, we can save one man. Well, what do you think, Mrs. Hollis? I I don't know. I'd ask you both to sign releases, of course. As he says, there's nothing to lose. Well, I suppose not. I, I wish I could ask Andy. Unfortunately, that's impossible. Uh, at least we'd be doing something. I suppose you're right. Yes. But of course you are. All right, I'll, I'll sign the release, Dr. Peter. <laughs> Keep your shirt on. I'm coming. Uh, Paul, uh, uh, can I come in, please? Sure, sure. Come on, come on in. What's uh, got you so upset? Well, there's this doctor, Dr. Peters. Yeah. He's a brain surgeon. And according to the guy on the radio, just about the best there is. And he's going to do a brain transplant job. Brain transplant? Uh huh, that's right. That can't be done. This Dr. Peters, he thinks he can do it, and he's going to try. Maybe doing it right now. Well, that's interesting. Do but... you want to know whose brain is getting transplanted? Okay. Andy Hollis's brain, that's who. State Senator Andrew H. Hollis. you kidding. No, I'm not. He was in this auto accident yesterday afternoon. Did you hear about that? No. No. Was he badly hurt? I, I guess he must have been. He was busted up pretty good. And they got this other fellow there in the hospital. Uh, I, I can't remember his name. He's dying from brain cancer. And they're going to transplant Hollis's brain into the other fellow's head. Mm. Well, maybe Hollis will die before they get a chance to operate. I told you, the radio guy said they were going to try any minute. Yeah. I got I to gotta think about this. You uh, think that Hollis... Uh, well, you know, when they get the switch made and everything... You think he'll shoot his mouth off? I don't know. Now, just shut up. Let me think. Come in. Well, hello, John. Hello. Um, I got this message. The important Dr. Randolph Peters wants to see me. Yes, come on in. You are actually going ahead with the brain transplant. Yes. Don't you approve? Well, surely. Why wouldn't I... I don't know enough about it to disapprove anyway. <laughs> Dr. Muller, the eminent psychiatrist, has just admitted there's something he doesn't know much about. That's practically newsworthy. <laughs> well, give me a half hour to bone up. I'm going to need your help, John. I think we're going to overlap a little here. Yeah, I've been thinking about that. If that transplanted brain works at all, it will have gone through something pretty damn traumatic. It frightens me a little. More than a little. Can I depend on you to stand by? You know you can. Well, then, I guess I'll go do it. Right now? Right now. <laughs> We've got a serious problem, Carl. 
Yeah? On, on, on account of Hollis? Well, you don't have to be a doctor to know that Hollis is going to be in pretty rough shape, or, you know, his brain is after his operation. My guess is he's going to be delirious for a while. He's going to be babbling, and if he babbles about the wrong things, well, we could be in a lot of trouble. I guess so. The turnpike repaving job. Good Lord, if they ever start checking on everything we've contracted for since Hollis has been chairman of the of the State Senate Public Works Committee. Oh, boy, we will have had it, Carl. Yeah, I like the Cedar River Bridge. Mm. Morrison and Dunlap will be finished, all washed up. Yeah. But why would he want to talk? He's no cleaner than we are, is he? But they haven't been playing games with our brains. There's no way of knowing what his brain may spill. So? What can we do about it? Maybe the operation won't be a success, huh? No. And maybe it will. So? I don't know. Well, I think a hospital waiting room is the most dismal place in the whole world. Mm. I've spent most of my time here for almost a month now. Has your husband been sick that long? Well, his operation was a month ago. He's been sick a lot longer. Oh, it must have been dreadful for you, Mrs. Kemper. <laughs> it wasn't nice. You know, it seems we're, we're going to be seeing a good deal of each other. Don't you think we'd be more comfortable on a first name basis? Yes, I do. Esther? Mm. I think I'm still in shock. They called me yesterday afternoon and said Andy had been in a bad accident, and I, I haven't really been able to grasp it. Yes, it must have been a terrible shock. I, I've had almost a year to adjust to Ralph's situation. You, you called your husband Andy. Is he... Andrew Hollis, the state senator. Yes. They asked him. They've been talking to him about running for governor. Oh. It doesn't seem fair, does it? A man in his prime. Nothing but good things to look forward to. And no. What is it? That man just coming in. Hmm? I'm sure he's here to ask about Andy. I don't want well, This is Hollis. They told me I'd find you here. Uh, how's, how's Andy? Well, we don't really know. Didn't they tell you what's happening? I heard it on the radio. Brain transplant, they said. Yes. He's, um, there in the operating room now. Oh. Well, I'm sure everything's gonna be okay. Everything can't be okay. Not for both of us. Oh, oh this is Mrs. Kemper, Mr. Morris. How do you do? How do you do? You're, uh, you're the other, the other fellow's wife. Yes. Uh, do they, uh... Do they say how long the operation is supposed to last? No. Uh, a long time, I should think. Hmm. Well, I I guess I'll just uh, wander around and, you know, be nosy. If there's, if there's anything I can do, Mrs. Hollis, anything at all. Well, thank you. I think not. Well, then, uh, I, I expect I'll be seeing you later on. I can't stand that man. Is, is he a friend of your husband's? Oh, a business acquaintance, a contractor or something like that. In politics, you have to be nice to all kinds of people. I've always wished Andy didn't have anything to do with Paul Morrison. I think he's a thief. Beautiful, Dr. Peters. The most beautiful piece of work I've ever seen. Thank you, nurse. But let's not congratulate ourselves just yet. He has a long way to go. Oh, yes, I know. I don't want him out of his sight for a second. I, I understand, Doctor. I'll be in my office. Let me know at once if there's any change of any kind. I want readings taken every ten minutes, you understand? And keep in touch with me. Hey, you were over there at the hospital a long time. Paul, did you get to see him? No way. I was just, uh, you know, uh, looking things over. There was no way they were going to let me see him. Does it look like he's going to be okay? I couldn't tell. Couldn't tell. I guess so. They got a special room all rigged up just for him. I sneak a look at it, room 394. I don't want to forget that. You never saw so many gadgets in all your life. You know, the more I think about it, Carl, the less I like it. Yeah? Mm. He's not going to be the same man. How could he be? Well, same brain, though. I mean, it's Hollis's brain, no matter who else has got it in his head now, isn't it? I wish I knew. I'm afraid he's going to have to be... Uh dealt with. You don't mean... 
Oh, hey, I, I don't want to be part of anything like that. Well, neither do I, Carl. I suppose nobody ever really wants to kill anybody. Now, uh, look, rigging bids and kicking back to Hollis, that's one thing. But th this other... No, no, I don't want any part of it. I was all right when when the money was rolling in like for nothing, wasn't it, huh? But this thing, Paul, this thing you're talking about, it's too much. I, I, I can't get mixed up in it. I mean, I can't. You'll be okay, Carl. You just have to get used to the idea, that's all. It's a business deal. Just a business deal. Don't think of it as murder. Oh, isn't that Dr. Peters? Yes, Jean. I, I think he's seen it. I guess... I guess the operation's finished. Oh, I've been looking for you two. Have you both been right here the whole time? Uh, how... Is he all right? Doctor. The operation appears to have been successful. He's in the special recovery room we set up for him. But he isn't conscious, of course. Won't be for a good long while. Can I... Can we see him? Not just yet, I'm afraid. Later on. Maybe toward evening. We don't want to complicate things. Dr. Peters. Yes? I haven't mentioned this to Jane, but I imagine she's been wondering, too. When he's better and... You know, when he can talk about everything. Which one is he going to be? This is the first operation of its kind, you understand. We're all waiting to see what will happen. Yes, but... But who will he be? I can't really say. <laughs> Good question. Who will he be? You have the brain of Andrew H. Hollis in the body of Ralph Kemperer. And by which name do you call him? More important, to Jane Hollis and Esther Kemperer at least, whose husband is he going to be? Which aspect is dominant? The physical or the mental? By which of the two forces is identity established? Perhaps we'll see this tangle unravel when I return shortly with Act Two. It is generally agreed that there is a spiritual quality in the makeup of every man and woman, quite apart from the mental and physical. Call it soul, essence, basic element, whatever. Now, should surgery, as has happened here, place the brain of one man with its millions of memories, its education, and its convictions into the body of another man, will the essence of which we've been speaking, the soul, weigh heavily enough to determine identity? What are we going to do, Esther? I don't know. I, I've been thinking about it, Jane. If Dr. Peters doesn't know, he'll... Whichever one he is... He'll be a stranger to both of us. It's worse. It might al almost have been better if... We'll, we'll just have to wait and see, Jane. What else can we do? But, Paul, this is murder you're talking about. He wouldn't be alive today if Dr. Peters hadn't done this nutty operation on him. He was slated to die anyway. Can't you see that? Well, not because of me, he wasn't. Look, Carl. Carl, I've got three kids. You've got two, right? Right. And I don't want them to grow up knowing that their old man is a murderer. If you want them to grow up with their old man in jail for the other stuff, bribery, conspiracy, you name it, Carl, they'll pin it on us if Hollis shoots off his mouth. But we don't know that he's going to. He may not say one damn word. Maybe he can't talk for Pete's sake. Look, there's, there's got to be some way so we don't have to kill him. All right. All right, you tell me what it is. I, uh... I haven't had a chance to think about it yet. Well, you can think until your head drops off, Carl, and you won't come up with anything but what I've come up with. Uh, it's, it's my way or nothing. We've got to kill him. I don't know if I could. You can. Well, well, we've got plenty of time. He won't be out of the hospital for a good long time. At least there's no rush, We huh? don't have any time at all. What do you mean? We can't afford to wait. We'll have to go into the hospital after him. <laughs> Hello? 
Hello, Andy. Oh, hello, John. Come on in. Congratulations. They tell me it was absolutely beautiful. I was sure you could do it. Thanks. Sit down. Ah. You look so glum. Come on, Randy. You just completed maybe the most brilliant piece of surgery in medical history. I want your advice, John. All you have to do is ask. I'm worried about this brilliant piece of surgery. Worry? Isn't he doing all right? He's alive. The body has accepted the brain. So far, at least. But that's not my problem. So, what is? There are two women sitting out there. Mrs. Hollis and Mrs. Kemper. Which one is waiting to see her husband? I'm beginning to think I've got a tiger by the tail. He is still unconscious, of course. Will be for... I don't really know how long. Mm. The only thing we can do is wait and talk to him when he can talk. How about an educated guess right now? Mm. How educated would it be? Well, my guess would be that identity would go along with the brain. I mean, at least lean very heavily in that direction. So you think it'll be Hollis? It's only a guess. You can't discount the body, certainly. There's a whole nervous system in there of which the brain is only a part. The most important part, granted, but still only a part. But if the body doesn't reject the brain? Physically, you mean? Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, and I'm guessing, of course, all that does is place the brain and the rest of the body in contention. Anything could happen. The body is long accustomed to taking commands from the brain. How is it going to respond now? And the brain, when it doesn't get the responses it expects, if it doesn't, well, who knows? Who's to say it won't break down completely? Well, that was a chance I knew I'd have to take. It's the identity problem that's got me worried right now. Yeah, I have only one suggestion. Huh? Wait until he can talk to you. And then ask him who he is. <laughs> Dunlap? I don't know any Carl Dunlap. What did he want? Oh, something about the Hollis Kemper thing. Well, I guess I better see him. I'll take any help I can get from anybody. Uh, Dr. Pierce? Yes, come in. Ah, thank you. I'm Carl Dunlap. Yes. I don't believe we've met before, have we? No, no. Uh, I mean, I was a, a business associate of Andy Hollis. Is he going to be okay? He's doing as well as can be expected. Well, that doesn't mean anything much, does it? Well, he's in intensive care right now. The operation was successful, as far as we know at this point. What's your interest? Well, you see, we, we had this business proposition, and it was hanging fire when he had his accident. And I can't go ahead with it without word from Hollis. You won't get any kind of word from Mr. Hollis for a good long while yet. Well, this is a really big deal. There's over a million dollars tied up here. It's, it's kind of a mess, unless I can get to talk to Hollis. I'd advise you to find another way to straighten out your affairs, Mr. Dunlap. It may be several days before Mr. Hollis will be allowed visitors. You were right, Paul. I couldn't get in to see him. Well, you agree with me now that there's only one way we can go? But we don't know that he's going to talk, Paul. We don't know that he won't. Look, I don't want to gamble, Carl. Well, no, I guess... I, I guess I don't either. Good. Then it's settled. Now, all right, now here's where we do it. The easiest thing in the world is to impersonate a doctor. You put on a lab coat, hang a stethoscope around your neck, and you're a medic, right? I guess so, as long as nobody asks you for a pill. It's good enough for walking down a hospital corridor. Well, we don't have lab coats. Well, it's That's easy enough to get. We go someplace and buy them. I'll take care of that. You've got a gun, haven't you? Yes. So have you. Do you have a silencer for you? No. Now, listen, oh, that's, Paul. That's all right. That's all right. I can pick up one. 
So once we get inside the house... Now, wait a minute, we... Paul. You've got a gun, too, haven't you? Why my gun? Because you're going to do it, Carl. Oh, no. No, I'll, I'll go along with the idea, even if I don't like it, but you don't get me to shoot him myself. No, Paul. Sorry. That's the way it has to be. Well, why? You're the one who wants him out of the way so bad. Why should I do this? Because if I do it the way you're running around so scared, you might just get an attack of conscience or something and start talking. Oh, that's silly. Why would I do it? But if you do it yourself, you're going to think twice before you make any stupid confessions. I won't do it, Paul. Sure you will. You can't make me. (laughs) That's just the point. I can. You'll do it simply because I tell you to. You always do everything I tell you to. Haven't you noticed? They sent a couple of containers of coffee back from the nurse's station. Mm-hmm. They've been so nice. Oh, I hope you like milk and sugar in yours. I, I didn't know. Oh, that'll be fine, Jane. Just so there's some coffee in there. It's going to be a mess, isn't it, Esther? For us? I'm afraid so, yes. What we need here is a... a Solomon. I suppose when he wakes up, when he regains consciousness... You'll know who he is. It's strange. At first, I was feeling so grateful to your husband, to you, for donating his brain to Ralph. Now I'm beginning to wonder if it it isn't the other way around. Your husband donating his body to Andy? I guess that's what it will amount to. Oh, Lord. I'm so confused. And another thing I've been wondering... Where are we going to stand? Legally. I hadn't even thought about that. (laughs) To tell you the truth, I'm not even sure how I want it to come out. Hey, Carl, hey. Yeah. Will you help me with this stuff, huh? Well, you've been shopping or something? What does it look like? Yeah, take this. Yeah, okay. All right, now, I got the... Lab coats and stethoscopes. Oh. I didn't have a bit of trouble. I figured at least they'd ask for identification or something, but they didn't. Just hand the stuff over and took my money. Okay. Yeah. Take a look here. Here, here try this one on, huh? Right. Ought to fit. They only come in three sizes, small, medium, and large. I got mediums. Well, it's kind of tight around the middle. Well, you wear them open anyway. Now, here, put the stethoscope on your neck. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you'd have made a pretty good doctor at that. I don't like it. They just stop thinking about it, huh? When the time comes, just do it. Uh, let me have your gun. What for? I got a silencer. I just want to see if it works all right. I keep it in here. I never once used it. I just thought I ought to have one around. Millie's home alone so much. I don't know what good it would do her, though. She won't touch it. Let me, let me have it, huh? Yeah. Fits all right. Is this thing loaded? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I, I, I don't know. Listen, Paul, couldn't you... I mean, I, I'm not the one that ought to... all settled, Carl. But what if I just freeze and then I can't do it, huh? I never pointed a gun to anybody all my life, Paul. I think... I mean, I think, really, that you ought to do it. Now, you'll do fine. Just fine. I'm not the least bit worried. Dr. Peters? Dr. Peters? Yes, what is it? I asked you not to leave your patient. Look, Doctor, I, I think he's coming, too. I, I saw you pass by the door, and I decided it would be quicker to come after you than to have you paid. All right, let's go. You say he's conscious? Well, no, not what you could call conscious yet. Hmm. He seems to have gone back to sleep. Oh, just a minute ago, he... he was... Oh, I can't... He can articulate. That's all right, then. I Somebody help me. What can we do for you? Help me. Born near, Indianapolis. You were born in Indianapolis. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Born Boston to... Somebody help me. Who? Who am I? Who am I? A question.
question originating in the depths of an awesome darkness. Loss of sure identity is the final step off the solid substance of security. If you must ask who you are, there is no safe place for you. You are a wanderer among uncertainties, lost in a maze bounded by the unknown, inhabited only by you and fear. The mind with no secure haven in which to rest and restore itself will manufacture a haven of its own. And this is what is commonly known as madness. I'll return shortly with Act Three. This Christmas, give a gift that'll help turn any kitchen into a fast food restaurant. Hi, Pat Summerall here to suggest you give the Hamilton Beach Little Mac or Double Mac Grill from your participating True Value Hardware store. The Little Mac Fast Cooker has a reversible grid with a square side for grilled sandwiches and a round side for hamburgers, pizza, or fried eggs. The cover locks on for spatter-free cooking, and the no-stick finish is easy to clean. The Hamilton Beach Double Mac Grill from your True Value Hardware store makes two hamburgers or two grilled cheese sandwiches in just minutes. It can even be used to fry bacon and eggs together, quickly and easily and without spatter. This Christmas, give the gift that'll help turn any kitchen into a fast food restaurant. The Hamilton Beach Little Mac or Double Mac Fast Cooker from your participating True Value Hardware store. Remember True Value. That's more than just a name. It's their way of doing business. And remember, too, tell them Pat Summerall sent you. Who can say with authority what the brain is to the body or the body to the brain? Which is master and which is servant? To be sure, we tend to characterize the brain as the thinking and therefore the guiding mechanism, but it is not the entire being. It represents, by any physical measurement we know how to apply, only a small percentage of the total entity. Is it reasonable to assume, then, that it contains the entire identity, the essence of the individual? Well, John, you're the psychiatrist. You've talked to the patient. What do you think? I think, as you said before, we have got a tiger by the tail. <laughs> this is completely outside my experience. Outside anybody's. But I will tell you one thing. Hmm? You have opened up a whole new, unexplored territory. If brain transplants are to develop, we are going to have to scurry about and build a new psychiatric framework to contain them. You're stumped? We're stumped, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a thousand questions, no answers. Yeah, that's a start, at least. The questions have to come before the answers. What are some of them? Well, this Hollis brain of yours has some Kempera memories. He has demonstrated that. Kemper was born in Indianapolis and Hollis in Boston. Hollis Kemper, for want of anything better to call him, now states that he was born in Indianapolis and Boston. Incidentally, I think his mentioning it indicates that he is trying to cope, trying to come to terms with the discrepancy. Anyway, what this means to me is that there is a memory the Indianapolis memory outside the brain. And the way I learned it, memory is strictly the brain's province. Final memory? Mm, who knows? There's not supposed to be any such thing. You know, the temptation is to turn metaphysical. Metaphysical? Mm -hmm. The soul. The unsensed, unmeasurable something that makes us more than mere matter. It is a temptation to say that since Kemperer's body still lives, it still contains something of the Kemperer's soul. That's not very scientific, I'm afraid. Mm, still, it's an answer that satisfies in some ways, isn't it? Not one that satisfies the scientific purpose, though. Where do you go from here, Randy? 
I was hoping you could advise me. I'm sorry. How do you let go of a tiger without getting scratched? Carl, would you stop looking so scared? Huh? Doctors never look scared, even when they are. And we're doctors. I can't help how I look. I am scared. Well, don't be. There are just two doctors walking down the hospital corridor talking shop talk. Well, his room number is 394. Three doors down, other side of the hall. You see it? Partway closed? Yeah, 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 I see it. What if they moved him to another room? They wouldn't. They've got him plugged into so many gadgets in there. It'd be just too much trouble to move him now. now you know what we do, right? I guess so. We take a look in the door. If the doctor's in there, we just walk down the hall and wait for him to leave. If there's nobody there but the nurse, we go in and order her to leave. Order her? We are doctors. You keep forgetting. Nurses do what doctors tell them to do. Okay. And then when we're alone with them, you... You just do it, that's all. I tried to get in to see him, Jane. I didn't have any luck, but I, I tried. Well, Dr. Peters wouldn't let you in. The nurse wouldn't. She stopped me at the door. She was nice enough, but she was firm. He's still all right. <sighs> Well, the nurse said he was sort of half-conscious for a little while. Esther? Yes? Look, those two doctors just passing down the hall. Did you get a good look at them? Not very. Well, what about them? One of them was... I'd swear one of them was Paul Morrison. The man who was here asking about Andy earlier. The, the one you didn't like? Yes, that one. But he's... Is he a doctor? No. That's just the point. He isn't. So what is he doing in a white coat? You think he's up to something? I don't know what he could be up to, but... But I don't like it. Damn, I forgot about her. Forgot about her? His wife, Jane Hollis. She was in the waiting room just now as we walked past it. Did she see you? Does she know you? No, she knows me, all right. I'm not sure whether she saw me or not. Well, let's get out of here, Paul. If she saw you, we'd better just get out oh, of here. Take will you stop it, will you? You panic at the least little thing I hear. We'll just stop and lean against the wall and talk. We're in consultation, okay? And if she doesn't do anything about it, well, she didn't see me. This is crazy. Here's this big hospital, busy as Grand Central Station, and we're going to walk into a man's room and shoot him dead. People all over the place, but does that stop us? No, we just walk in there and shoot a man dead. And then walk right out again. The best way to get lost is in a crowd of people. Insane. Oh, there she goes. The Hollis one? Uh, yes, with the other one. They're just strolling along, going the other way. I guess you didn't see me. So you want to go ahead with it? Of course we're going to go ahead with it. Come on. Just sort of stroll along. So if he sees us, he'll think we're just stretching our legs. Mm -hmm. well, did you get another look at him? No. I was afraid to look down that way. I know it was him. I'm sure. Oh, so what are we going to do? I just want to see if I can find Dr. Peters and tell him about it. Okay. Here it is, room 394. Will you wipe that scared look off your face? I'm doing the best I can, Paul. All right, all right. Just let me check. I don't see anybody but the nurse in there. The doctor doesn't seem to be around. Paul, I wish... Just shut up and let me do the talking. Uh, nurse? Oh, you startled me. Is this Dr. Peters' patient? Uh, yes, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Peters has called us in for a consultation. We expect him any minute. Will you, uh, will you please leave us alone with the patient? Oh, well, Dr. Peters instructed me to stay with the patient. Well, we'll be with him. You needn't worry. I don't like to go against Dr. Peters' instructions. Uh, we will take the responsibility. We expect Dr. Peters momentarily. Meantime, we can save time by examining the patient while we're waiting for him. I, I could stay and assist you. I mean, if there's anything you want to know, Nurse. I... Nurse. I've asked you to leave us. Yes, Doctor. Paul. What is it? We got in the wrong room or something. What are you talking about? That's not Hollis. Look at him. I never saw that guy before in my life. Of course it isn't Hollis, you idiot. They transplanted Hollis's brain into somebody else. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. Well, well then how can we be sure? I mean... If we never saw the guy before, how do we know we're in the right place at all? We are. All right. Do it, Carol. Paul, please, if you just listen to me, I don't think... Do I... it! Wasn't 
Isn't that the nurse we just passed? Isn't she supposed to be in there with him all the time? Oh, it certainly looks like her. You think we ought to go back and make sure he's all right? Somebody probably came in to relieve her. I just want to see Dr. Peters. Okay. I oh, hope he's in. Dr. Peters? Yes? Oh, Mrs. Hollis and Mrs. Kemper. What can I do for you? We just saw an odd thing. Odd thing? There's a man I know slightly, a, a business associate of my husband. I don't like him, frankly. I don't trust him. I just saw him out in the hall, dressed like a doctor. And he isn't a doctor? He certainly isn't. Would it be possible for him, and uh, well, he had somebody with him, would it be possible for them just to walk into the patient's room without anyone stopping them? If you're afraid that's what he's going to do, there's no cause for alarm. There's a nurse in there. Oh, but she isn't, Doctor. We just saw her out in the hall. You're sure it's the same nurse? Positive. Then maybe we ought to go and check it out. There she is. See? Standing there at the nurse's station. Nurse? Yes, Doctor. I thought I asked you not to leave the patient alone. Not for any reason. Well, he isn't alone, sir. The two doctors you asked in for consultation are with him. Consultation? I didn't set up any consultation. They said you did. They they practically ordered me out of the room. All right. Let's go. Hey, Andy. Can you hear me? It's Carl Dunlap. Can't see how you're doing. Now, will you stop it? Can't you see he's in no shape to talk? Well, then, if you, if you can't talk... Shoot him, Carl. You you, you take the gun, Paul. I, I can't. I just can't do You'll it. You'll do it. Now, right there, in the temple. No, no, not quite touching. Uh, there, there, right there. That's it. Now, now, the trigger. The trigger, Carl. No, no, Paul, I can't. Just squeeze the trigger. Just a little pressure. It doesn't take much. That's the way now, once more, to make sure. Paul, Paul, please, I can't. Sure you can. Uh, just squeeze, squeeze like before, Carl. Just squeeze. Uh, 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 what are you two? Oh, my God. Shoot them, Carl. Ralph, he's bleeding. Why is he bleeding? Get out of my way. Let me have a look at him. Did you hear what I said, Carl? Shoot them. No more. No more, Paul. I can't. He's dead. Shot twice through the head. Don't let me have the gun, Carl. Give me the gun. No. You heard what I said. Give it to me. I won't. Carl, give You'll it to me. You'll only kill somebody. Let me I won't that. let you, Paul. Let me have the no, gun. No, I won't. <laughs> oh, Paul. Oh. I didn't mean to shoot you, Paul. It's my arm. Doctor, will you take the gun? I'll take it. Nurse, get some security people in here, will you? Have they taken those two away? The two who shot your patient? They're probably all booked and put away by now. I just had a weird experience. Mm -hmm. That's the only kind you have had all day, it seems to me. I just had to console two women, Mrs. Hollis and Mrs. Kemper, because their husbands were dead. Only that wasn't what I did. I found myself telling them I was sorry about their husband. Singular. One husband, two wives. And nobody could say who the man had actually belonged to. Yeah. Sad things though, all around. Yes. In a way, though, <laughs> they were grief-stricken, of course, the two women each thinking of her own husband as he used to be. But as for the man I was trying to give them with my surgery, I'm not sure they weren't just a little bit relieved that he was gone and the decisions wouldn't have to be made. Mm, you know something, Randy? I am not sure the world is ready for the brain transplant. I'm not sure it ever will be. we should be just as glad that the brain transplant isn't ready for the world. As things stand now, one more spiritual dilemma might be just that one too many. I'll be back in a few minutes. The 1977 Buick Regal. It comes with Buick's terrific V6 engine. It carries six people and lots of Buick comfort. It's lean. It's maneuverable in city traffic. It's the most luxurious mid-sized car Buick builds. Yeah, this new Regal is pretty much everything a car should be. Except for one thing. 
It isn't yours yet, but it can be. Just see your Buick dealer for a test drive. Soon. With the human mind striving as it always must toward the accomplishment tomorrow of today's impossibility, it's not surprising, perhaps, that among the blessed miracles performed, some heinous enormities are also perpetrated. It may be that the transplanting of a fine mind from a sick body to a healthy one would be a good thing. But wouldn't it present the kind of problem our story has dealt with? How could it not? Our cast included Gordon Gould, Ann Williams, Bryna Rayburn, Robert Dryden, and Joe Silver. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>